Good to be back with you. For the last uh, 20 years or so of my grandmother's life, anytime she would try something new, it was always met with the same phrase. So maybe we would gather together for a family meal and, and somebody would, would use a new recipe, a new dish, and they'd say, hey, Grandma, try it. And she'd take a bite. What do you think? Her response, well, it's different. And we never knew. Is that good, bad, or somewhere in between? We'd get her a new gift, some present she had never had before, and she would unwrap it, and she'd look at it, and she'd say, thank you, it's different. When I was in college, my parents stopped buying traditional birthday and Christmas presents for my siblings and I, and instead, they pulled all of that money that they used to spend on gifts, and they put it aside for like a big family vacation. So every two or three years, we take a big, a big family vacation somewhere. Two of those family vacations have been family cruises. Our second family cruise was about nine years ago, and we invited Grandma to come along. And she had the time of her life. I mean, she was a trooper. She, she tried new foods. She went on excursions with us, had new experiences. She swam with dolphins. I mean, she was having a blast. When we got to the airport after it was over, I don't remember who it was, but one of my siblings looked at Grandma and said, Grandma? How was your first cruising experience? Well, it's different. Is that good, bad, or somewhere in between? For many of us, new equals different, and we're not sure if this new and different thing that we're taking, that we're entering into is good, bad, or somewhere in between. And maybe that's where you find yourselves in this season. Entering into a new space, into, entering into a new time of life, a new season. And this new and different season, you're not sure if it's good, bad, or somewhere in between. Some of you, maybe you just finished a certain school, and you're looking ahead toward the fall, and, and you're going to be going to a brand new school. New teachers, new classes, new classmates, new subject material, and you're not sure if this new season is going to be good, bad, or somewhere in between. Some of you maybe are entering into a new season with your family. Your, your oldest just graduated high school and is heading off to college, and you're not sure about this new season. Is it going to be good, bad, or somewhere in between? Maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum, and your, your youngest is heading into kindergarten this fall, and you're not sure about this new season. Is it good, bad, somewhere in between? Got a new job? Or maybe you're newly retired and, and you're entering into this new season and you're wondering, have I saved up enough money? Am I going to like this new job? Is this new season going to be good, bad, or somewhere in between? And as a church, you're in a new season, currently without a lead minister, looking ahead to what God will do in the coming weeks, months, and years. And if you're honest, some of you might have questions in your mind. Is this new season that we are entering into, is it going to be good, bad, or somewhere in between? And you know, that's probably a question that was on the minds of the Israelites. They had just come out of one season and were entering into a new season. Moses, the only leader they had ever known, has just recently died. He, had, he led them out of Egypt. And as God parted the waters of the Red Sea, and they crossed on dry ground, Moses was leading them. As they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their wickedness and rebellion, Moses was leading them. Until God wiped out an entire generation of rebellious Israelites, and eventually Moses himself dies as well. Just outside the land that God had promised Abraham. Looking in. And now here they find themselves, the only leader they've ever known dead, buried in an unmarked tomb. The one who rescued and delivered them, dead, buried in an unmarked tomb. The one who would fulfill God's promise to Abraham, dead, buried in an unmarked tomb. What do you do when all of your hopes and dreams lie dead and buried in an unmarked tomb? 
That's where the Israelites find themselves at the beginning of the book of Joshua. Waiting on a new leader. Waiting for this new season. Wondering what this season is going to look like. And since, since Joshua is a book that's all about leadership transition, I thought it would be appropriate that t- today we explore the beginning of the book of Joshua. So if you've got your Bibles and want to follow along, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 1 today. If you're kind of new to the Bible and not really sure where the book of Joshua is because we don't talk about it a whole lot in in church, Joshua is the sixth book of our Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then the book of Joshua. That's where we're going to be. So if you want to turn there, Joshua chapter 1 is is where we're going to be. Joshua chapter 1, and just kind of as a reminder, Moses has just died, and so God addresses Joshua, preparing him to be the next leader of the people of Israel. And in the first paragraph of of the book, the first five verses of chapter 1, we really see a layout or an outline of the whole book. So in verse 2, when God begins to speak to Joshua, we get a roadmap of the first five chapters of the book. Here's what God says to Joshua in chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. And in the first five chapters, that's what we see happen. We see Joshua and the leaders of Israel make preparations to get ready and cross the Jordan River and enter into the land. So if I were giving you a one-word label for the first five chapters of the book of Joshua, it would be the word enter. They enter the land. And then the very next verse gives us an outline of chapters 6 through 12. Here's what God says in verse 3. He says, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. And guess what we see in chapters 6 through 12? Everywhere that Joshua places his foot, everywhere that the Israelites go, God gives them that land. So if I were giving you a one-word label for chapters 6 through 12, it would be the word give. God gives the land. The next verse then outlines chapters 13 through 21. Verse 4, God says, Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. And in chapters 13 through 21, we see each tribe receive its allotted portion. God kind of marks out boundaries for every tribe to receive their inherited land. So if I were giving you a one-word label for chapters 13 through 21, it would be the word inherit. They inherit the land. The last three chapters of the book are outlined in verse 5. Here's what God says in verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in the final three chapters, Joshua is an old man. And he's looking back on the long life that he's lived, reminded of all the ways that God has been faithful seeing evidence that God never left him, that God never abandoned him. He was never forsaken. And so he gets up, stands before the Israelites, and tells them, in light of God's faithfulness, live faithfully in the land long after I'm gone. So if I gave you a one-word summary of chapters 22 through 24, it would be the word live. They are encouraged to live faithfully in the land. And that's the book of Joshua in the first five verses. Chapters 1 through 5, they enter the land. Chapters 6 through 12, God gives the land. Chapters 13 through 21, they inherit the land. Chapters 22 through 24, they are to live faithfully in the land. But this first paragraph, it doesn't just give us an outline of the book. It does that, but it does more than that. It also introduces us to the main character, the main actor in the story. Now, on first glimpse, it may seem as if the main character is Joshua. I mean, after all, the book is named after him. But upon a closer inspection, it's pretty evident that the main character, the one pulling the strings, the one who wrote the script, is God himself. Let's take a closer look. Notice all the pronouns in these first few verses. Back in verse 2, God says, Into the land I am about to give them. Verse 3 I will give you every place, as I promised Moses. Verse 5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is God's story. 
This is God's story that he was writing in the lives of the Israelites. They're not writing the script. God writes the script. And God invites them to be participants, to be, to be players in this narrative, in the story. And church, I think that's a good reminder for us. Because sometimes we tend to think we are the main character of our story. That we are writing the script for our families. That we are writing the script in our workplaces. That we are writing the script in our schools. But you're not. God is the one writing the script. God is the one who's pulling the strings. God is the one who's, who's leading. And he invites us to participate in the story. And church, I think that's a good reminder in this season for you. Because you're in this in-between space, heading into a new season. And in this in-between space, you've, got, you've had a search team and elders who have been going through candidates and resumes and interviewing. You've got staff who have been picking up slack and doing extra work. And, and it may seem at times like the elders are the main actors of the story. It may seem at times like the staff are the main actors of the story. But the elders aren't the main actors. The staff, they're not the main actors. God is the main actor. This is God's church. And he cares way more about the present and the future of this church than anybody else in this room. Even those who have been here 30, 40, or 50 plus years, God has more invested and more at stake in the future of Southern Heights than anybody else. He cares more about this church than anyone. And I believe that, that God has good things in store for Southern Heights. But new and different, well, it can be really exciting. It can also be scary. So I wonder, what are you afraid of? Let me confess. I suffer from a phobia called ophidiophobia. Anybody else? Ophidiophobia? Show of hands. No? Fear of snakes? Okay, a few more hands. Yeah, I thought that. All right. True story. Probably about seven, eight years ago, something like that, I was preaching at a church camp. Actually, I was preaching at Gasconade, their high school week of camp, seven or eight years ago. And uh, I, so I was, I was doing all the evening messages. And so I, I would go out to a gazebo during the day, like where nobody else was, and i just kind of run through my message for that night over and over and over until I felt like I really knew it by heart. So one particular day, I'm at this gazebo on the edge of the campground, and the woods are probably 15, 20 feet away from me. I'm running through my message, and in the middle of one of my run-throughs, I see out of the corner of my eye, coiled up next to the bottom of a tree, a snake. Now, I'm no snake expert, but this snake, it had shades of brown and burnt orange. I think to myself, that's a rattlesnake. And I don't know what to do. I realized in that moment, I got three options. Option number one, I can just suck it up. Just, just power through it. I ain't afraid of no snakes. But that wasn't going to happen. Option two, I can run away screaming like a little girl. I contemplated option two. Ultimately, option three chose me. Freeze in your tracks. And so I stood there, immobilized, frozen by fear. Probably 30 minutes passed, and I just stood there. I couldn't run through my message anymore. All I did was stare at that snake. Until a gentle breeze came through the camp, and the snake stood up. And I thought, not only is this a venomous rattlesnake, it's a shape-shifting venomous rattlesnake. And that's when I realized this rattlesnake was actually a pile of leaves. <laughs> Fear of snakes. Here's the best part. Guess what I was preaching about that night at camp? How to overcome your fears. Ophidiophobia, that's me. It's actually a pretty common fear by the show of hands we saw earlier. There are other common phobias. You've probably heard of some of them. Arachnophobia, fear of spiders, pretty common. Aerophobia is the fear of flying. Acrophobia, the fear of heights. Agoraphobia, I'll start with A so far, the fear of large crowded spaces. Claustrophobia, fear of tight, compact spaces. Thanatophobia is the fear of death. Glossophobia, the fear of what I'm doing right now, public speaking. Those are all really common phobias. But there are some really strange and peculiar phobias out there. Let me share some of my favorites. There's phobophobia. It's the fear of fear. It's kind of self-defeating. 
I'm afraid of being afraid. Oh, no! I'm afraid of being afraid of being afraid. Double no! Uh, there's triskaidekaphobia, the fear of the number 13. If you suffer from triskaidekaphobia, let me just say to you, 13, 13, 13. There's sedan globophobia, it's the fear of cotton balls. Yeah. Arachibuterophobia, kind of sounds like arachnophobia, nothing to do with spiders. It's the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. But here's my favorite. Hippo, pado, monstros, esquipedalia, phobia. Fear of long words. How cruel is that? Some dude in a white lab coat somewhere is like, what do we call somebody who suffers from a fear of long words? I got it. Longest word, most syllables, most difficult to pronounce. So anytime somebody asks, what are you afraid of? They have a panic attack. <laughs> My guess is, if we're honest, many of us would acknowledge one of the things we fear is change. Change is new. Change is different. And maybe we fear it because it takes us out of what's comfortable. Maybe we fear it because it, it moves us away from status quo. Maybe we fear it because of all the uncertainty attached to the new. And if we're not careful, our fear of change can leave us immobilized, frozen in our tracks, keeping us from the, God, from the good thing that God wants to do in us and through us. And maybe you've been living your life frozen in fear, entering into a season of change, looking ahead at retirement, frozen by fear, looking to a new job, frozen by fear, looking to a new season in your marriage, frozen in fear. And how, do you, how do you overcome immobilizing fear that could prevent you from the good thing that God wants to do in you and through you? Well, I think the rest of this story gives us the answer. It's a churchy answer. It's not going to be surprising to you. Here, here's the answer. Here's how we overcome that fear. God's people need God's word. I told you, it's a churchy answer. But it's simple. If we're going to overcome our fear that could keep us from the good thing that God wants to do in and through us, we need God's word. Three times in the next four verses, God will tell Joshua to be strong and courageous. In other words, don't be afraid. And then he gives the antidote. Then he gives the solution. God's word. Now, in these few verses, God's word will take three different forms. First, God's word takes the form of a promise. God keeps his word. God is faithful to keep his promises. When God says he will do something, he will do it. Notice in verse 6 how God continues speaking to Joshua. He tells him, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. God says, Joshua, I made a promise and I intend to keep that promise. A long time ago to Abraham, I made a promise, and I'm going to keep my promise. As followers of Jesus, as worshipers of God, we need to trust that God keeps his word. Our God is faithful. Our God is trustworthy. Every fall, at the beginning of the school year, the faculty of Ozark Christian College, where I teach in Joplin, we have an annual faculty retreat. It's, it's a way for us to to reorient our mind for the upcoming school year. It's a way for us to do some brainstorming, to think about our curriculum, but it's also a way for us to kind of reconnect. Because in the summer, all of our faculty, we kind of go our separate ways. We all do stuff like this. Go and preach at churches, camps, conferences. And so we're, we're going out across the country. We don't really see each other a whole lot in the summer. And so in August, when we reconvene, we do an overnight retreat at a nearby camp. It's about an hour away from the college. And so we reconnect a little bit, and, and I was reconnecting with John this, this last year. John is a buddy of mine who teaches at the school. And John said, hey, did you know that I bought a car over the summer? I said, I said no, you did. What would you get? Yeah, new car, uh, a 2002 Toyota Camry. 2002. 
John, wasn't your old car a 2003? Yeah. So your, your new car is older than your old car. Yeah. It got me thinking about Joshua. Sometimes the best way to prepare to sit in the driver's seat of the new thing that God wants to do in your life is just to remember an old thing. Just to remember an old, old promise. Just to remember God's faithfulness. That was true for the Israelites. Do you know how much time had passed since God had made the promise to Abraham to send them into this land? Almost 500 years. Do you think it's possible that sometime in those 500 years, some of the Israelites began to question, is God going to keep his word? Is God going to be faithful with his promise? Maybe that's where some of you have found yourselves as well. Wondering, is is God trustworthy? Is God dependable? Will God keep his promise? Will he keep his word? And God reminds us, he is a promise maker and a promise keeper. If God says it, he will do it. Our God is trustworthy. Our God is faithful. He can be depended upon. God's people need God's word. We need to trust that God is a God of his word. Sometimes God's word takes the shape of promise. But secondly, sometimes God's word takes the form of Scripture. God's people need the word. We need the Scriptures. We need to pay close attention to the words of Scripture. We need to follow and obey and trust. Notice how God continues in verses 7 and 8. God says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. God says to Joshua, if you want to make sure that the Israelites are successful in this next season, in this new thing that I'm about to do, make sure they're keeping my word close. Make sure they're paying attention to my instructions, to my law. Make sure they're obeying faithfully. God's people need God's word. In order to keep us from veering off of of the path. And maybe as you reflect on recent months and maybe this last year, you you realize you've, you've veered a little bit in one way or another. Maybe as you think about how you spent your time, you realize that your kids' sports took a front seat and God kind of took a back seat. You veered because God's word wasn't close. Or maybe you've been spending so much time binging your favorite shows and movies, sitting on the couch, you haven't really been a good steward of that time and you realize you veered because God's word wasn't close. Maybe it's not time, maybe it's when you think about money. You realize you haven't really been a good steward of the resources that God has given you. You veered because you didn't keep God's word close. Maybe it's in your thoughts. You realize over the last few months, there have been a lot of negative, critical thoughts in your mind. Negative thoughts about yourself, about your spouse, about your neighbors, maybe even about people in this church. And you veered because God's word wasn't close. Maybe it's in what you look at. The images that you see, the websites you scroll through, you veered because God's word wasn't close. Or the words that you speak, mean, hurtful words, condescending, speaking negatively about someone behind their back, you veered because God's word wasn't close. If we want to make sure that we don't veer off of God's path in this next season, we got to keep God's word close. God tells Joshua to meditate on it. And that word meditate, it means to mumble under your breath or to speak softly under your breath. God's word is always to be on Joseph's breath. Uh, Excuse me, on Joshua's breath. So let me ask you, where do you keep God's word? Some of us, if we're honest, we keep God's word on a shelf collecting some dust. Some of us keep God's word on the end of a coffee table and we open it up to impress our guests Many of us keep God's word on our phones because it's convenient and we open it up whenever we need answers to questions. Some of us keep a few of of God's words on our minds, ones we memorized 
as kids in vacation Bible school. But according to Joshua 1, the best place to keep God's word is right here. On your lips. In your mouth. Always keep God's word close. God's people need God's word. Sometimes God's word takes the form of a promise. Sometimes God's word takes the form of scripture. But thirdly, God's word takes the form of presence. God in person with his people. Take a look at verse 9. God concludes his speech to Joshua in verse 9 by commanding him again, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God says, Joshua, you don't have to go into this next season all by yourself. You don't have to walk into this on your own. I'm going to be with you. And apparently that was enough for Joshua. Because in the next few verses, Joshua goes to the officers of the people and he gives them instructions to make preparation to enter into the land. He goes to two and a half tribes east of the Jordan River who have already inherited land and tells them, hey, take up arms, fight alongside your brothers. And here is how the people of Israel respond to Joshua in verse 16. They say, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. They say, okay, Joshua, we're in. And then they basically repeat some of the very same words that God gave to Joshua. Notice the very last sentence of the chapter into verse 18. They tell Joshua, only be strong and courageous. So what made the difference? What made the difference in Joshua's life? What enabled him to step into this new season of leadership? God's presence. What made the difference in the people of Israel that allowed them to trust this new leader after the only leader they had ever known is gone? God's presence. God's people need God's word. We need the living word, God in person, in flesh with us. And in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the word, John 1 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God's people need God's Word. Several months ago, my, my son Joshua had a, a rough day, a rough rest time. I was in an all-day church meeting. It started at like 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning and went to like 3 p.m., and I was mentally exhausted when I got home, and so I was going to come home and kind of lay down and rest for a bit. But when I walk through the door, I hear my son Joshua yelling at my wife, Ma! His rest time did not go very well. My wife tried something new that day. She said, I'm going to let you sit out on the couch. I'm going to turn TV on, and you can watch Curious George for your rest time. She went away and did some laundry in the laundry room, came back out, and he was gone. He decided rest time was over. And without her permission or her knowledge, he decided to go outside and play. And she comes and finds him and, and takes him into his room, and he's in timeout, and and, and after a few minutes, she goes back in and says, Joshua, you have broken trust. Because I cannot trust you to do your rest time on the couch. You will have to finish your rest time in your bedroom. Now, you're not in timeout anymore, but you've got to stay in your room. You can play with your toys, but you've got to play quietly. Stay in your room. And she tried to leave the room, and, and he just chased after her, screaming. And that's when I walked through the doors. And they're having this back and forth. He's lying on the hallway, throwing a fit. And so I think, well, maybe my son Joshua just needs some daddy wisdom. Happy Father's Day out there to all the men in the room. And so I, I walk back there, and I basically just repeat everything my wife had already said. I didn't have anything original to say. I say, Joshua, you heard your mother. You got you to go back into your room, finish rest time in your room. And he didn't budge. I said, Joshua, if I have to pick you up and carry you back into your room, you're going to go back into timeout. He doesn't move. So I step over him, I go into his room, I grab a couple of his little toy cars, I lay on the ground and I kind of crash them into each other. I say, hey Joshua, doesn't this look fun? Why don't you come and play with your cars? And he gives me a look. Are you gonna leave? I said, I mean, I'm gonna leave your room because it's rest time and daddy needs rest time too. But I'm not gonna leave the house. He says, Ugh. 
but I'm scared. I said, Joshua, why are you scared? Mommy and daddy are here. The sun is shining. You're safe. There's no reason to be scared. He said, because I won't have my person. And what he really meant in that moment, I'm afraid of being alone. And what my little Joshua needed in that moment was the same thing that big Joshua needs in our text, his person. And church, aren't you so glad that we have a God who is present with his people, that we have a God who says, I will be your person, a God who is present in all of our uncertainty, a God who is present in all of our pain. A God who is present in all of our trials. A God who is present in the unknown. A God who will never abandon you. A God who will never reject you. A God who will never turn his back on you. A God who will never leave you or forsake you. A God who says, I am with you. And church, I am for you.